Hello? Hi, General Clark. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to interact with you. I really do appreciate it. It's really an honor to, uh, to interview you. And um, thank you for agreeing to let me record this for my students. Let me uh, start by acknowledging and uh, speaking about you know, who you are a little bit for some of the folks who uh, might be viewing this. You were the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe and you helped, uh, and this is, Kosovo is gonna be the focus of our discussion today because that's a place that you helped to really create through your tenacious embrace of the ethnic Albanian Kosovars and their right to have self-determination back in 1998 when their existence was threatened by a very aggressive Serbia. I wanted to start by asking you, given that backdrop, can you paint a picture of what was really going on and what propelled you to act in such a dynamic way? So I came out of command of the 1st Cavalry Division at Fort Hood, Texas in 1994, and I went to Washington, and there was no Soviet threat. The whole purpose of organizing the United States Armed Forces was open to discussion. Uh, but we understood that there were problems, not threats necessarily, but problems. One of these was the problem of regional instability. In 1990, Former Yugoslavia, put together really by Woodrow Wilson at the Versailles Treaty in 1919, at the end of World War I, the Kingdom of the South Slavs. Well, the problem was that there were, there were, there were Slavs, and there were Christian Slavs, and there were Catholic Slavs, uh, Greek Orthodox Slavs, or Serbian Orthodox Slavs, and, and there were also Muslims, and they were all thrown together. Some had been centuries-long collaborators with the Ottoman Empire. Others had been centuries-long opponents of the Ottoman Empire. Some were communists. Some were affiliated with the German occupation of Yugoslavia in World War II. And when the communist dictator, Josef Tito, passed from the scene in the early 1980s, the conglomeration of the Kingdom of the South Slavs, known as Yugoslavia, came apart. Um, it started to unravel as nationalist tensions rose. And these nationalist tensions had been buried under the leadership of the Communist Party. And then with, without Tito there, people began to go back to their roots, so to speak. And uh, Serbs began to sing Serb songs and Croats began to sing Croat songs. And Slovenians thought, I really like Austria. It's right next door. And so what was cohesive maybe or appeared cohesive under Tito in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, wasn't really cohesive. One of these regions was a corner of Serbia that was populated by about 2 million people. It's a, it's a mountain valley. Honestly, uh, it, it's just almost like a square surrounded by high mountains on, on almost every side. And um, most of the population were ethnic Albanians. Ethnic Albanians were in the region before the Slavs ever arrived. They were the ancient Illyrians. But unfortunately for the ethnic Albanians, they had been overrun by the Turks several hundred years ago. And most of them were no longer Christians, they were Muslims. And so this created an ethnic, linguistic, and religious divide. So you had a population of around 2 million people in this area that was like a, sort of like a square that was like 60 or 80 miles on either side, surrounded by mountains, pretty rich agricultural land, uh, but 90% of the population was Albanian and 10% was Serbian Christian and the wealthy Albanians controlled the land and the mean Serbian Christians controlled the government and the police and the army. And they decreed that you couldn't any longer educate your children in the Albanian language. And that since Albanians weren't that trustworthy, they shouldn't be in government. In fact, they shouldn't be licensed to do pretty much of anything other than house servants and, and, and so forth and poor farmers. And they could even give up the land that a produced fee to the Serbs and the Serbs would take the land. So there's a lot of tension in this. And um, the, the Albanians uh, 
are a stubborn group of people anyway. That's their, one of their cultural characteristics. They've maintained their identity. They're so-called Illyrians. They've maintained that identity for 2,000 years in the crossroads of Europe, where all these armies are going back and forth, and they still have their own language. People used to joke they're the only, um, they're the only nationality that when they want to say yes, they shake their head, and no is like this. But it was, it's, it's a unique group of people. And so they, they fought back against the Serb cultural domination and really cultural imperialism of Serbia. And um, this, this was, uh, there was violence there in 1992, really, but, uh, but it, got, uh, it got put aside because of the major preoccupation of Serbia with the war in Bosnia. So I got on the scene in 94, and one of my jobs was to write the policy, and I got involved in the Balkans. And as somebody said, if you get involved in the Balkans, it's a lifetime employment opportunity, but you're probably going to get fired. <laughs> and, and so yeah, I went over there the first time, and it was I got to meet these terrible Serb generals. I got to meet the Serb leadership, the several, the many ter Serb generals and many other people there to really understand what was going on in Bosnia. I went with Richard Holbrook to help do the peace talks. I wrote the military annex with some help from allied officers and obviously my own staff. And, um, and then also the return of refugees and the police annex. And um, we had learned from the intervention in Haiti in 1994 about the importance of police training and things like this and, and transparency on the police. So we put those lessons into the Dayton Peace Agreement. It was uh, ratified in December of 1995. I became the Supreme Allied Commander in 97. And I went to see my boss, the Secretary General of NATO. He said, your job is to implement the agreement. I said, oh, yes, uh, yes, Secretary General, I know uh, we'll do the military annex. It's, uh, I understand. He said, no, I mean the whole agreement. You're responsible for all of it. I'm like, oh, OK. <laughs> So uh, that was a lot different because my predecessor thought he only had to worry about the military piece. So I had to worry about the whole piece. And as we were trying to struggle with this in the winter of 97, 98, violence emerged again in Kosovo. A group of uh, young people uh, who call themselves the Kosovo Liberation Army decided that Serbia was, was just oppressive. And, um, and they did small things like ambush a couple of policemen and so forth. And the Serbs cracked down brutally. It was a real effort to go after them. And in February of 1998, they went after the, they considered the ringleader, a man named Adam Jashari. Um, like many Albanians, he had an extended family. He owned property. And uh, so anyway, they were besieged by the Serb police. The Serb police put two rings around his farmhouse, one ring facing in and one ring facing out, so none of his neighbors could interfere, and they put him under siege, and anyway, when they broke in, they lined the people up on the floor and shot them. Women, children, babies, right through the head. So this was an explosive incident, and, um, and it really triggered the start of what later became uh, the Kosovo action for NATO. From that moment on, the Serbs escalated their oppression. This uh, also spurred the recruitment for the Kosovo Liberation Army. And Albania, who was not directly involved in this, was a member of NATO Partnership for Peace. And they said, we can see the mortar shells falling on our cousins from the high ground overlooking Kosovo, 10,000 foot mountains between Kosovo and Albania. We can look from these mountains and we can see the mortar rounds falling. We know this is war. What's NATO going to do? Well, we'd just been through from 1991 on this conflict that took four years to settle in Yugoslavia, in, in Bosnia. And now here was conflict breaking out in another corner of former Yugoslavia, part of the province of Kosovo. What were we going to do? Because the conflict in Bosnia generated two million refugees. And as one of the neighboring presidents of Macedonia said to me, he said, look, these uh, Albanians, they're not like the Bosniaks. These Albanians, they'll fight. This is gonna be war. You gotta take this seriously. They're not gonna roll over in front of the Serbs. So um, we started in NATO looking at what we could do and we decided um, 
to prepare a set of concept plans. This was in, in NATO, you can't do any military planning unless you're authorized, directed to do it by the political authorities. So it's not like the general could say, hey, I wonder if we're gonna have a war. Uh, you guys uh, form up a plan and tell me, no, none of that. They tell you at the political level exactly what you're going to do. So we produced a set of concept plans that were politically approved. They involved flying an air mission around the borders of Serbia to warn Milosevic about NATO air power. We'd used it a little bit in Bosnia. It helped bring it into the fighting in 95 there. So we knew he was sensitive to NATO air power. Then we said, okay, well, uh, but if that doesn't work, or if he's still killing people, what should we do? We said, well, for a little incident, you know, we can do a bombing raid or two into Kosovo. For a big incident, whatever, if that doesn't work, then we all went all the way up to an invasion and occupation of Serbia in this series of plans. But they weren't real plans, they were just concepts. And they were approved politically. It's like, uh, oh yeah, let's put these concepts out there. Uh, I'm sure nothing will ever happen. So we're busy, you know, in Spain and Germany and France, it's summertime and people want to go on vacation. Okay, approve the concept. So over the summer of 1998, the Serb ethnic cleansing really accelerated. By September of 1998, 400,000 Albanians had been driven from their homes. Why? Why were they driven from their homes? Well, because the Serbs have a methodology of ethnic cleansing. First, they isolate the village so you can't get out. Then they send the special police through with the names of who they want to address and arrest. These are the human rights workers, the lawyers, the educated people, the doctors, the community leaders, they get arrested. And then they send in what they call the paramilitaries, the gangs, who at the time, I guess, televisions and electronics were worth more than they are today. But they would go from house to house, give me your gold, give me your cameras, give me your television, give me your this, give me, give me your daughter. And so uh, people, heard this come they 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 got out any resistance the paramilitaries were you were shot i mean that was the end of it so there, there were there were some people killed and 400,000 people were living in the mountains pretty rough mountains you're like 8,000 feet 9,000 feet babies being born snow covered in the winter ski slopes uh pretty untrafficable serbs didn't pursue up there they knew better um because these people are armed uh they knew they'd been through this uh, but but they couldn't stand up to the Serbs themselves. So NATO then in the fall of 1998, began a series of diplomacy and threats to Milosevic. And we, I, we made six trips there. Holbrook made two, I made three, somebody else made a trip, all to see Serb President Milosevic and tell him to call it off, stop the killing because you're inciting the violence. If you just stop it and you're reasonable with these people, they don't want to fight. Why do you want to start a fight? Your overreaction, you're killing people. These people won't forget it. You kill their relatives, yeah, they're going to come after you. So stop the, stop the violence. That's not the way to deal with it. Instead, treat them humanely. Give them the rights that every European citizen expects. to Be educated in their own language. Have the freedom to travel and associate and so forth. So um, after these six trips, we got the fighting stopped. Milosevic pulled out many of his military units and uh, we tried to get a peace agreement and Ambassador Chris Hill went in and dealt with Milosevic, but nothing happened. And there was a Russian military delegation that visited just before Christmas. And I guess they told him, ah, ah, NATO, don't worry about NATO. Uh, you know, NATO, uh, air power won't do it. Are we, we tried it in Afghanistan. We weren't successful. NATO is not going to be able to do anything to you. So right after uh, the first of the year, the ethnic cleansing started again. 53 Albanian farmers were lined up in a ditch and shot. NATO had a special meeting. The French stepped up to do their version of the Dayton Peace Agreement. Ah. These Americans, they got all the publicity and glory from stopping. France will do this this time. 
<laughs> okay, so they hosted these agreements in Rambouillet at a palace, and they didn't produce agreement. Instead, what they produced was a Serb refusal to admit a NATO peacekeeping force that would have stopped the KLA from ambushing the Serbs, and it would have provided visibility and stopped the Serbs from, you know, killing the Albanians. We were prepared to go in and, and you know, be in, in between. Um, but the Serbs said no. We were left with the same dilemma that we had in the case of the Bosnia proposal. You give the agreement to both sides and you say, look, this, <laughs> you've got a choice, but it's not a choice without consequences. If you say no, then if you're Albanians, you're, we're not supporting you, you're on your own. If you say yes, then we'll support you. If you're Serbia and you say yes, then we'll support you and we'll make this work. If you say no, then we're on the Albanian side and you will suffer the consequences of the NATO plans that have been prepared. Well, given and that, why, why was Milosevic so intransigent then, given that, that, that choice? Um, three reasons. One, he had believed he had gotten stronger Russian support. Mm. The Russians had changed from 1995 to 1998. The KGB in the new form of the FSB came back in power behind the scenes. Vladimir Putin was now running the intelligence arm. And uh, Yevgeny Primakov, who'd been the man who helped create the Palestinian terrorist organizations, was now foreign minister. And Yeltsin was old and feeble, and his friend Beal, he wasn't able to see Beal as much as possible. And so Milosevic felt like he had a stronger ally in Russia. Secondly, um, he, I think, was a little embarrassed by some people saying to him from the right in Yugoslavia, Slovo, you sold us out to these Americans, that evil Richard Holbrook and, 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 and Clinton. And uh, you're not true. You're not a true Slav. You don't stand up for our principles and our country. We have been the defenders of Europe and you have sold out to these Muslims and blah, 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 blah. So I think he was under some pressure from the right wing. And I think third, he had an agenda. What happened when Yugoslavia collapsed was there were Bosnian Serbs and Bosnian Croats and Bosnian Muslims, but there were also Croatian Serbs as well as Croatian Croats. And in the summer and fall of 1995, these Croatian Serbs were driven out of Croatia. And so he had several hundred thousand Croatian Serbs as refugees in Serbia. I think he thought maybe if I'm tough here, I'll get rid of these Albanians. You know, the problem is there's not enough good Serbs there in Albania. In Kosovo, we'll push some more Serbs in and make these, these Albanians a minority, something like that. Anyway, he was pretty stubborn on it. He tried to call our bluff. And, um, but NATO doesn't bluff. Not with you in command, sir. <laughs> well, NATO is the kind of organization politically, it's not good at bluffing. Because it knows that once it says it's going to do something, if it doesn't do it, its credibility is threatened and all hell could break loose. So we told them what was going to happen if they said no. They said no. So Secretary Albright says, what are we going to do? I said, well, you're going to do what we always do. You know, you said you were going to do it, you're going to do it. So we started the bombing campaign. When we started it, some people said, well, how long, will it, is, how long is this going to be? I mean, three or four days, a day, what is it? Some people said, when Serbia realizes the might of NATO is deployed against them, they will surrender immediately. Okay, that was, that was possible. How am I to know? I didn't know whether it was going to be three or four days or three or four months or three or four years. It was unpredictable. It was open-ended. And this was the way we ran the campaign. That way we had, we said, we're, we're using this 
this is, we're trying to get diplomacy backed by the use of force. Diplomacy backed by the threat of force failed. Milosevic restarted the ethnic cleansing and on the 21st, 20th or 21st of March, full bore. And uh, so, um, so that was marked the failure of diplomacy backed by the threat of force. So then we had to go to the next thing, which was diplomacy backed by the use of force. So that was the use of force. I called my counterpart in Serbia, General Oydinic, the morning after the first bombing. I said, now look, General, we've met before and you know, this is the start of something. If you don't want this, you need to come back to the negotiating table. Let us do the peacekeeping. He said, I will not talk to a war criminal bombing my country. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> uh, so I called Madeleine Albright, Secretary of State, and I said, here's what happened. She said, oh, she said, don't do that again. She said, let the let's handle this through all diplomatic channels. The next thing I know, it's we've been bombing for about a week and a half, two weeks, and I'm in Brussels to meet Madeline for breakfast, and she says, what are we going to do? <laughs> they won't talk to me. The Russians won't talk to me. Nobody will talk to me. So it's going to be up to your bombing. So this is going to be victory won by bombing. Uh, no such thing. So we had to get the negotiation started. So um, we used a, a model agreement that we'd used in Bosnia again. And um, Washington managed to persuade Finnish President Atasari and Russian Vice President Viktor Chernomyrdin, who'd been close buddies with Al Gore, Vice President, to go to Milosevic eventually and carry a peace agreement. But meanwhile, we escalated the bombing every day because the whole idea is keep the pressure on. It's not talk or fight, it's use the bombing to generate the pressure to require accession of a diplomatic agreement. That's what the strategy was. And so we had to escalate the, the use of force, which we did. We started with 300 aircraft, we ended up with 1,000. We started with uh, 50 targets only at night. We ended up with hundreds of targets, 24 hours a day. We started by coming in only over the Adriatic. We ended up coming in from many directions. Um, and the Serbs realized they, they, they couldn't do anything to stop us. This was the key. We did have two aircraft shot down eventually. But we stayed at high altitude. We used precision bombing. We avoided their air defenses where we couldn't destroy them. And um, so basically, the aircraft campaign was indefinitely sustainable. It was intensifying. So this was one element of diplomatic coercion. Second element was that we had uh, begun the preparations for a ground invasion. This was part of the NATO plan. Um, and it said, if the bombing doesn't work, we're going on the ground but we actually began the planning for it and preparation for it. Serbs obviously knew that. Russians had spies everywhere to tell them what was going on. Was Tony Blair involved in that effort? Did he, was he one of the fellows who pushed that? So Tony Blair came to see me. It was the uh, Tuesday before the NATO summit, 50th anniversary summit in Washington. And um, he came in and I, uh, it was a one, he was the first head of state to come see me. He said, um, I said, well, Prime Minister, can I give you a brief? He said, no briefing. He said, I just want to know, you're going to win with this air campaign? I said, we could, but there's no guarantee. He said, well, will you get ground troops if you need them? And I said, well, for that, I'll depend on you, Prime Minister, since you asked. <laughs> he said, I'll get them for you. It was like a... 10 minute, 15 minute meeting. Wow. The next day he flew to Washington that morning. He met with Bill Clinton in the Oval Office. They discussed it. And um, Clinton said, well, you know, I said, I said I had no intention of using ground troops. Yes, yes, I know. It was one of those artful political statements. I have no intention, present tense. Yes. So it doesn't mean you can't change your intention. So they had this discussion like, what, what, what are we going to do? The bombing had been going on at this point for about 30 days. 
the Serbs were ha hanging tough. They were actually reinforcing the troops in Kosovo. They were intensifying their ethnic cleansing. They were going into villages, seizing people, shooting people, dumping bodies in mine shafts. Some of the bodies were put in trucks and shipped up to, to be buried in, in Serbia. One of the trucks ran off the road and sunk in a river and the police saw it, they pulled it out. They said, what's in this truck? And they opened it and said, oh my God. It's like 40 or 50 dead bodies in it. From the, so even you know, the people in Serbia didn't really understand what was going on. Hmm. And um, so it was getting brutal. And so there was no guarantee really of what was gonna happen. So the negotiations were being put together, it's true. Um, but as long as Milosevic thought he was gonna win, why would he negotiate? As he said, it's my country. NATO doesn't care about Kosovo. We know the French and the Germans. They just, they, the, the Americans are forcing them to do this, but they don't want to do this. One of the French generals said to me, he said, said, you Americans keep wanting us to bomb these bridges over the Danube in Belgrade. Said, who do you think is going to have to pay to rebuild these bridges when this war is over? I said, who do you think? He said, France. I said, yeah, France. <laughs> so, yeah, there. I mean, it's like the way NATO works is it looks like it's monolithic. That's what you want it to look like. But inside, there's all kinds of different attitudes and people pulling and pushing different ways. But um, so Prime Minister Blair and President Clinton agreed that the way they would say this is NATO will do whatever is necessary. This was the key formulation. Because if you're Slobodan Milosevic, says, Jesus, they'll do whatever is necessary. I can't shoot down any airplanes. There's nobody I can invade. He tried, he at one point, he took the half million people that lived in the capital city of Pristina, forced them onto trains and dumped them in Macedonia. <laughs> I got a call from the president of Macedonia, he said, these Albanians are coming into my country. They're going to destroy my country. Gen Mr. General, you must do something. So this was part of Milosevic's effort to strike back was to destabilize a neighboring country. Wow. But he didn't succeed in that. And another thing he did is right after the bombing started, he told his military, there are American forces in Bosnia, go bomb them. So the military, I guess, put together a strike package. They had four big, 29s to fly air defense, air protection. They had six bombers. And um, there was a NATO airborne early warning system flying over Bosnia. It was obsolescent. It turned like this. It didn't see anything big long term. But there was a US Air Force pilot flying an F-15C. And he, his radar picked up the strike package. And he called to get permission and they, he said, I've got bogeys. I said, splash them. He fired two long range, advanced, medium air range, air to air missiles. He hit two MiGs. Each missile hit a MiG, and both MiGs, boom, down. At that point, the strike package flew back to Serbia, and that was the end of it. So Milosevic knew he couldn't do anything to NATO. We were impervious to his air defense, we were impervious to strikes. He couldn't destabilize neighboring country. He had no choice. Then we were planning a ground invasion. And then the International Criminal Tribunal looked at all this and decided to indict him for war crimes. He was cooked. He was finished. He said, okay, I'll pull my forces out. I'm leaving. You can have it. It was 78 days, wasn't it? 78 days of bombing. You know, you illustrated your relationship and yours, you speak uh, uh, Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton, and I have spent some time in Pristina, and I'm sure you must be aware of how positive Americans are viewed in Pristina, but I can't buy a drink or a cup of coffee for myself there as soon as I identify myself as an American. And your name and Madeleine Albright and Bill Clinton, you are so loved and respected there. I mean, I hope you are aware of how important no, it's, been, it's been very gratifying to see it and i'm sorry that we had to do it honestly um it would have been much better if it could have proceeded through a normal diplomatic process you know i think the basic rule 
is you can should only use force as a last, last, last resort. But we had tried not to use force. We did a demonstration. We tried negotiations. I personally met three times with Milosevic to tell him to stop this. And then I went down a fourth time in January after the massacre. And he simply was stubborn and recalcitrant. He was like daring us. Then we did the, then the French did the negotiation. So we tried everything. And finally Milosevic started the ethically, he said, I've had enough with this. Finish them off. Get rid of these Albanians. So that's when NATO had to act. Last resort. Sir, in, in the time remaining, why does, uh, I wanted to ask you to address why Kosovo is still sort of a, uh, in, a, in the dark, so to speak. Only 54 uh, nations recognize its passport. It, it, it doesn't, uh, it's still very much influenced by Serbia's domination of the area. Can you speak to what efforts are needed to bring Kosovo into the light and make sure other countries, I mean, five EU nations don't recognize its existence. And that's uh, problematic. Well, first of all, uh, there's been a you know, strong uh, presumption in the European Union that you cannot change borders by force. Unfortunately, this was a case where there was no way after the murdering of these Kosovo civilians by the Serbs, that there was no way you, you could put the country back together again. It, it just, people's memories are too long. They, 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 look at, they looked at the Serbs as murderers. Their own neighbors, in some cases, murdered members of their families, ran them off their farms. People have a long, long memory. In the United States, we don't appreciate this so much because the Civil War was a long time ago. But if you'd been in this country in the 1880s and 1890s, and you talked to people in the South about what happened when the Yankees came in, or if you talked to people uh, in Pennsylvania about what happened when the rebels came up, up there, you have some strong opinions. People don't like it when you kill their relatives and they don't forget. So we couldn't put it back together again. So Spain has a problem with Basque separatists. Greece has a problem uh, with uh, Cyprus, so forth. And so these countries um, just are reticent to recognize because they're afraid it will be used as a precedent that their own minorities, but, but there's more to it than that. There's also Russian pressure and Serbian pressure. Serbia has eight, nine million people. Kosovo has two million people. Serbia is an industrial giant, really. It's a, it's a very prosperous country, and a lot of other countries trade with Serbia. So Serbia has made it very clear that they shouldn't recognize Kosovo. So it's hard for some of these countries to muster the... And then behind Serbia is Russia. And so where you've got a lot of trade with Russia, you've got a lot of Russian tourists, Russian investments, like Greece, then there's a reason that they don't recognize Kosovo. My, my last question to you, General, has to do with young people and the inspiration that a leader like you and a commander like you can provide to young people. What would you like to say to young people today who may wish to serve our country and may wish to serve something greater than just themselves? Well, I hope that you do want to do something more than simply go out, have a good time, and, uh, and, and, and be with your friends. Because you've been given a country and freedom and political institutions that were fought for generation after generation. And you have an obligation to understand them and to stand up for them. So that means, first of all, participation in the political process here at home. So understand what the issues are, understand who the candidates are, what they stand for. And doesn't matter whether you're Democrat, Republican, independent, I don't care, but vote. Make a difference through your vote. Secondly, in your lives, I hope you'll have courage to do things and not always take counsel of your fears. It was really hard for NATO to do this. It was hard for me personally to do it. And I said prayers every night because I never knew what was going to happen. And I had my own, you know, personal scares on this. Um, people would call and say bad things and bad things happened. I remember one of the worst things that happened is 
we had an aircraft malfunction and it dropped a, a, a bomb over a schoolyard in Niche and three or four kids were killed. And I got a letter from a man in Serbia who said, you killed my granddaughter. I was just crushed. I, I, you know, of course I didn't do it and personally and it wasn't an accident, but it doesn't matter. People die and when, you, when you're dealing with these things, you can't make a joke out of it. You can't take it lightly. These are real people that are on the other side of this that they don't understand. All we really wanted was for Milosevic to treat his own citizens with respect and dignity, and he didn't. And what's going on right now in Ukraine is the same on a larger scale. How Vladimir Putin thinks he could possibly do what he's doing, murdering people, because they don't agree with this idea. They want to speak their own language. He wants to destroy their language. What is this about in the 21st century? He can't be permitted to get away with it. And the Ukrainians are sacrificing themselves to stand up for that ideal. So when you see that and you watch it on TV and you watch these pitiful families coming out and the father's left behind and they don't know if they'll ever see him again and so forth, just think about it. They're doing that for you because that attack on those freedoms could happen here at some point. It's going to be your responsibility to understand what you've been given and to protect it at home and abroad. And to do so, you'll have to take risks. You'll have to be uncomfortable. You'll have to sometimes dare to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. That's the message. Well, General Clark, uh, with leaders like you in this kind of position, the world's very fortunate because you had the resolute will to act in a moral way, despite the many variables you were juggling and the responsibility of your command. And I can't thank you enough for being willing to speak to me about this as these messages will get to a great many young people. And it's really inspiring on a personal basis to speak with you, given your storied career and the accomplishments that you've had and the effect that you've had, sir. It's not every life where you've had as strong and powerful an effect. And you know, your doctrine of applying force quickly to stop, uh, you know, and to get escalation dominance of a region, you know, that's something that had, had it happened again, uh, maybe the Russians might've been stopped. And here NATO is expanding and becoming stronger and you had a lot to do with that, sir. And I just can't thank you enough. It's a pleasure to meet you and- thanks. Pleasure to be with you and your students. Thank you. Thank you, General.